Welcome to 101 with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett and Lorna Virgili. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Mr. Leggett, for joining us again. Thank you for sitting out, sit, sitting down with us every single month to talk about all that is going on in Montgomery County. Welcome. Thank you for having me again. Uh, let's start with a budget. Last time we met, you had submitted your $4.56 billion budget to County Council. This was back in the month of March. And now the members of the council are back. They've taken a look at uh, your budget. What has been the initial feedback and I think, reaction? Yeah, I think overall pretty good. I, I think that there are some questions and obviously there are some differences between the legislative and the executive branch as usual. But overall, if you look at the budget historically, the budgets are fairly close to, to what is ultimately recommended by the county executive probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 97, 98 percent, we're only two or three percent adjustments, if at all. Now the problem for us this year is not so much what happens internally within Montgomery County, but what is happening in Annapolis, because that has a pretty profound impact on the decisions that we are making here locally. It may mean adjustments on my part to submit uh, additional amendments to the budget, and we have uh, what I call a wait and see attitude now to see what will happen uh, from Annapolis that will uh, affect the, the budgetary discussions that we're having here in Montgomery County. Um, with this original, and we'll go to Annapolis in, in just a minute because we know w what happened or did not happen in Annapolis uh, at the end of the wrap-up of the session, but um, initially uh, what have been perhaps the concerns and, and, and the challenges that you're facing and the county council might be facing as well? Well, the challenge that we're facing certainly are related to education, transportation, and help for the most vulnerable. I placed in the budget some increases strategically this year, first time in about four years, that would in fact uh, enhance our public safety personnel and equipment and resources. Because we are at a point when you compare Montgomery County's public, public safety personnel, especially police, uh, we are one of the smaller units in the entire region. And I thought we needed to go back to a master plan plan that we had some years ago to increase the police size over a period of time. Uh, the size that I would like to have over a three year period would be to increase the size by approximately 140 additional personnel in police, uh, about 48 this year and the rest over the next two or three years. So it's a challenge to make sure not only that we look at this year's budget for FY13, but understand the ramifications and the foundation that we're building for FY14 and beyond to ensure that we retain the police at a size and we increase it, that we ensure that we respond to some of the challenges we have in the, in the uh, emergency fleet for, uh, for, for buses that we are having some challenges with this year, to increase the size of the routes that we have in Montgomery County. Those are some of the challenges that we are trying to enhance into this budget. At the same time, we're trying to be quite prudent about how we go about doing this. Uh, when we talk about challenges, obviously we need to talk about funding where the money is going to come from. Mm -hmm. Last time we sat down and, and we talked about funding, uh, but let's go to Annapolis. A lot of uh, what's happened or not happened at the state level uh, during the session, they cannot fund their budget quite yet. They did not approve their budget. And how does that impact us directly here in Montgomery County? Well, there are two or three areas that I think will have a significant impact on us. First of all, the failure to approve a budget in Annapolis means that they reflect or go back to what is called the doomsday budget that would have a number of fairly significant cuts, about $50 million to Montgomery County, in addition to cuts in programs and services throughout the state. Uh, but for us, what was on the table originally was a change in the uh, way we fund pensions for teachers and would shift half that responsibility to Montgomery County. Uh, that number, the amount in terms of that shift, will cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $50 million overall. There are some additions in the budget that will hopefully offset some of that, but the additions are really less than $10 million in terms of real prudent investments that will come back to Montgomery County. So we're looking at a fairly substantial change, a change that will grow over a period of time, starting the first year at approximately $27 million and going up to about $50 million over the next two or three years. That's $50 million every year until this law has changed and more than likely will not change any time in the foreseeable future. In addition to that, we also have a change in the maintenance of effort law, which uh, place some very strong restrictions in our ability to access funds, the ability of the state to come in and literally uh, intercept revenues headed to Montgomery County in order to respond to the maintenance of effort requirements at the state level for the county. 
those two things alone really have a strong impact on our ability to go forward because it takes away some of the local autonomy, it increases the cost to Montgomery County, and it reduces our ability to fend off some of the old other things that we want to do in the budget, such as increase uh, revenues for police, fire and rescue, and libraries, and uh, some of the other requirements that have not been, uh, have not maintained the, the pace that we want them over the last few years. The teacher pension, going back to that topic in particular, is something that hasn't been approved quite yet, but we all know that something is going to happen and that perhaps if there's some sort of agreement, it's, it's going to come about. Uh, what is Plan B then for Montgomery County? Because obviously the county is going to get hit no matter what. Well, Plan B is that we'd either have to do one of two things, either reduce uh, cost in other areas of revenues that go into other areas, or we'd have to find revenues from other sources. In other words, cuts, reductions, or increased revenues. And I've floated a plan that I hope we can have some response to that could help us over the next few years. Because if you look at what we're talking about at the state level, at least over the next 10 years, we're talking about an increased cost to Montgomery County of approximately $400 million. That's a large amount of money. And so we've developed some contingency plans that will hopefully offset that, but uh, it may require adjustments of taxes, reductions, or as we've looked at now to go back to reevaluate the Emergency Medical Transportation uh, Reimbursement Act to see whether or not that can help us as well. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, when you said other um, sources of revenue, well, revenues <laughs> from other resources or sources, uh, what does that mean? Uh, I think that means taxes. Uh, and that's something that I'm trying to resist. We provided in this budget basically a flat uh, property tax. We are 20 plus million dollars under the uh, charter limit and I want to keep it at that level. It may mean, of course, that you'd have to raise revenues in some other areas of the county. Uh, but there are a number of ways that you could do this. Unfortunately, we have already expended a great deal of time and effort in the last few years uh, looking at additional revenues. And I, I think that the resistance to that uh, would be quite uh, shocking if you look at the reaction from many of the citizens throughout Montgomery County. So that's the last place that I would want to go. We're going to talk about that one last place yeah. that we all want to go. Yeah. In just a minute, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett. Welcome back to One on One with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett. I'm Lorna Virgili, and we continue this conversation regarding the budget. That's what we finished before we went to the commercial break. Um, Annapolis, the gas tax is something that's still pending as well. And uh, the increase in the income tax for higher earners, which would have a tremendous impact from so, for some of the Montgomery County residents. Um, what, when we talked last time, you were working with the county delegation in Annapolis. How much has that advanced, and uh, where are we heading? What direction are we heading in? And, and I know you cannot forecast what happens in Annapolis, but you've been obviously very involved. Well, clearly, as they reported out of the conference committee's reports, uh, there was no increase for a gasoline tax or revenues to help fund transportation and transit in the, in the, in the state. Uh, that's a real challenge for us, because if you look at the Transportation Trust Fund, uh, that fund simply, simply cannot support uh, the revenues that are needed in order to ensure that we have the transit, uh, transit and transportation challenges resolved in the state of Maryland and certainly here in Montgomery County. We have some fairly large uh, projects in Montgomery County that will come to a screeching halt if we're not able to resolve the transportation challenges. Uh, we need money certainly for the Purple Line, we need money for the Carter City Transit, and just a number of road and transit projects throughout the county. They are tied very closely to future development for this county and the failure to obtain the revenues for that could mean that a loss of jobs, loss of jobs means loss of a tax base and revenues for the county overall. So it was disappointing that we did not resolve the transportation challenges. Uh, the user funds for highways for the county uh, have been removed and reduced from about 40 million down to about a million dollars. That's a huge reduction and so uh, we need to have some relief in that area. Now, on the other side, uh, there were proposals that moved forward uh, that would in effect out, at least out of the conference committee, that would increase the uh, taxes on Montgomery County citizens, those making over $100,000, and that covers a great deal of people in Montgomery County. So for the entire state, 
that $100 million, uh, we calculate about 34, 35% of the entire state's total will originate from Montgomery County. And so our citizens are being hit on one hand with increased costs, i.e. teacher pension, and we're having to pay more for Montgomery County to absorb some of the other budgetary cuts uh, imposed by the state as well. So it's a real difficult challenge for us coming out of Annapolis. And what is next? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how, do, how does uh, not only the governor, but all of us, it included you, climb out of this uh, big hole? Well, we, uh, we will get out of it, and I'm, I'm optimistic about our future, but we need to make some adjustments. And, and one of the adjustments, as I've indicated before, is to go back to make certain that citizens understand why originally I proposed the emergency reimbursement fee for ambulance services and why I'm asking for reconsideration of that now. At the time that we looked at that uh, two years ago, we did not face the kinds of conditions that we see today. An awful lot has changed over the last two years. So all I'm simply asking of the citizens to listen, uh, knowing what you, do, what you know now, the prospects of potentially increase in taxes or to make even drastic cuts based on the lack of revenues and having to face an additional $400 million over the next 10 years, uh, we have an opportunity to get at least $180 million of that back to Montgomery County, thereby reducing uh, the cost to us in a significant way. Uh, will you want to continue that process or do you want to look at other revenues that will not cost us anything in order to do it? Before we continue on that path, let's remind the viewers what this ambulance reimbursement fee was all about because we dealt with it yeah. uh, for some time. <laughs> it went to the polls, was rejected by voters, what, 50, 46 right. percent? And, and we're back here again as one of those additional sources of revenue. Mm -hmm. Explain to, to the county residents what that is and how they are not directly impacted when you talk about this EMS fee. Well, the EMS fee already exists in virtually every jurisdiction in the entire region, all of them. And what you do is simply bill the insurance companies for the cost of the services provided by Montgomery County Emergency Services. So when an ambulance picks you up, then we will bill your insurance company. If you do not have the insurance, then certainly we cannot bill you and it's never difficult to collect it at all. But if you have insurance, you have Medicare or Medicaid, we simply bill the federal government or the insurance companies. Based on our estimates, uh, we anticipate collecting between 14 and $17 million as a result of that. At the time that we were considering this a couple of years ago, and Arundel County, for example, I went through the same kind of debate and decided to, in fact, institute it. Uh, as a result of that, they received somewhere in the neighborhood of $10 million addition to their counties collected from the insurance companies. It will not cost you anything. Believe it or not, you already pay the insurance premiums on it because they assume that the county is going to collect that. And so it's a windfall for no one else but the insurance companies. So it will not cost you anything. We will continue to pick you up whether you have insurance or not. But we simply want the ability to build your insurance companies for the services that the county provides. This is something that exists in virtually every jurisdiction around the region. It's obvious that uh, the economic and financial la landscape is very different from two years ago. And a lot of people might think it does make much more sense now, obviously, when you're talking about perhaps increasing taxes or further cuts. Now, when it comes to county council, some of them who were opponents in the past perhaps are a little bit more receptive. Is that correct? I don't know. I would hope that they would be. but I, you know the. It's in the details and we have to go back and go through the debate. What I'm simply trying to do is put the option on the table to make certain that we have this as a matter of consideration because I think it would be irresponsible for me to say, okay, we're facing a $400 million challenge and despite the fact that we rejected something two years ago where conditions have changed considerably, this is unprecedented in terms of what the state has done. Huge cost to Montgomery County, $400 million plus, a change in the MOE law having those changes to say we should be wedded to a decision we made two years ago when this kind of information was not before the voters. I said, okay, as an informed voter, I would want to know and understand what those conditions are and give me at least the option to decide whether or not I want to make an adjustment. That's what I'm trying to do. You said informed voters. So is the goal to push this through for a November ballot? Well, it, it could go there if the, if the opponents decide to fight it, but I don't know. That's something the opponents will have. But the first step is to make certain that the county council accepts this and votes favorable on it. And I hope that they will because I think they see the same numbers. And you look at FY13 and beyond, and this really would not start until January of FY13. To put us in a position 
so that when the additional costs come as a result of the teacher pension shift, if that happens, then we're in a much better position for that. To wait another year or two when we see this cost start in this January, I think it would be irresponsible. So if you were to per have to persuade uh, voters today, which it's not the case because you've got to persuade first the county council. Right, that's right. But if you were would have to be in that position today, what would you tell uh, uh, county voters today regarding the ambulance reimbursement? First, fee? things have changed. It's $400 million impact to us now. The MOE has changed. Secondly, you have a choice. Make further reductions in programs and services in libraries, public safety, or increase taxes, or build insurance companies which already are collecting monies for you to cover this cost. Given those three options, which would you prefer to do? That's a good uh, point to wrap up this second segment of, uh, of the show. Let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back to 101 with Montgomery County Executive Ike Leggett. I'm Lorna Virgili. Thank you for joining us again. And uh, we've been talking about budget, Montgomery counties, the state of Maryland, and how much, how dependent we actually are from the state regarding some issues. Um, Transportation-wise, let's talk about some good news, actually. <laughs> uh, there have been a couple of things in the county. Recently, you participated in the opening of the Glenman Garage. It was a big success and a big event due to the fact that you had funding from the state and uh, the county as well as uh, federal funding. What difference does it make when it comes to improving transit in the county, especially in that part of the county, Georgia Avenue, Red Line, Metro Red Line? Well, in Glenmont is one of the busiest stations in the entire county. Uh, we have approximately 1,800 parking spaces there now. Uh, but those spaces fill up prior to 8 o'clock in the morning. Therefore, large numbers of people cannot park. And as a result of that, they continue to stay in their automobiles and reduces the need, or reduces the people, the number of people who would otherwise take Metro. So what we've done across the street, adjacent to the Metro on the west side, is provide an additional 1,200 parking spaces. That number of parking spaces, hopefully, will reduce the number of people who are actually on the road so that they would actually come to that station, therefore find a place to spot, park and utilize Metro. Uh, when you look at that corridor, the Georgia Avenue corridor, the Lay Hill area, Randolph Road is a fairly congested area. And so what we want to do is to reduce the number of automobiles that are on the road to encourage people to utilize Metro. If you can't find parking, if Metro is not convenient, if people don't feel that it's safe, if it's not affordable, uh, they won't utilize it. I think people believe that it's a safe system. I think most people believe that it's reasonably affordable. But in some places, i.e. Glenmont, it is not convenient because it is difficult to get there, but for the cars, at least to the, to the station. So we're going to reduce that anxiety, if you will, and to make it a little bit more convenient for people to find places to park, therefore getting greater ridership and taking cars off the road in other locations. Well, transportation, gridlock, and, and congestion, it's obviously one of the big issues in the county. So let's drive to the other side of the county. Mm -hmm. And I know you and I have talked before regarding Walter Reed in that area and uh, all the development that has to take place and will be taking place and is taking place. What's the update on that? Well, Walter Reed is uh, in full swing now. Um, we are, as at least we've started now, with some of the intersection improvement based on the first phase of changes that we will be making in that area. Uh, unfortunately, when you make changes and you go through a construction period, it is somewhat inconvenient. And so I've tried to at least warn the citizens in the area that things may get a little bit worse before they get better because there may be times when the lane is not available, there's some work uh, ongoing in the intersection that may you know, at least reduce the inflow of traffic, the access to the area. But we're doing that in order to make it much better. And I think that about four projects are on the way, on the way now to help us. But it, it will get a little, little tight in the area for at least the next year or so. And hopefully after that, it, it will have, you'll see significant improvements. Well, one of those to alleviate uh, congestions, obviously, is riding right on buses. And uh, the county got really, really smart now recently with, with this new ride on smart feature um, for ride on uh, riders, passengers. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, what it's pretty cool stuff, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
We're taking advantage of the technology today, and that is that we now can properly locate the times and, and the locations of the bus fleet uh, to provide that information to the riders so that they will not be inconvenient waking, waiting too long at the bus sta stations uh, depot in order to utilize the ride-on system. So we have something that's called now real, uh, real time so that you can access this information uh, by route, uh, by bus, by location, and make an informed decision based on the information there when to come out to the actual bus stop because you will know in advance when that bus is scheduled to arrive. Uh, it has now gone into effect and based on the preliminary results that we've seen thus far, it is working. So it's available for you now uh, by route, by location, uh, or by uh, a number of other factors you can determine very clearly when the bus will arrive so that you're not waiting out, especially in inclement weather, when it's snowing or raining, you're getting there too early, but you can time it appropriately so that you can leave work or decide to leave home in an appropriate time to catch your bus. And it was really nice that you could call 311 to find out when your next bus was coming. Now you don't even have to call 311. No. Now you have this feature. And for those interested, the website is rideonrealtime.com. Uh, let's talk now about the Montgomery Serves Awards. It's the first year that the award is going to take place. Um, April 30th, this might be dated because the problem, this program runs for, for, for a full month. Uh, but um, what are you looking for, recognizing community leaders that serve volunteer work? It's the first time in Hawaii. Well, community leaders as well as organizations that have contributed to our county. We are a great county in Montgomery County because of so many leaders who've given up their time and served and volunteered to make this county what it is today. Uh, we'll recognize a number of leaders across the spectrum. Uh, the highest award that we're given is called the Roscoe Nick uh, Lead Community Leadership Award, and there are three people receiving the awards this year. One, of course, is the late Roscoe Nix, to whom the award is named after. Connie Morella, a longtime public servant who has served Montgomery County so well in a variety of capacities, not only Montgomery County, the state of Maryland, and this nation as a whole. And, of course, Chuck Lyons, a business person who really epitomizes the greatness of this county in terms of people who are willing to provide service, a business person who could take the community spirit and incorporate that into his business so that people are involved not only from how they can officially run a business, but also how to make a difference in our community. And so those three awards will be given and uh, we look forward to a very good uh, turnout, uh, a nice recognition of some outstanding people in a variety of categories. Uh, it should be a very fun evening. It's going to take place at uh, Imagination Stage in Bethesda, right. open to the public for tickets? Is that how That's it goes? That's right. It's open to the public. Uh, all you simply have to do is make certain that you make a reservation so we have uh, appropriate seats and locations for you there. Okay. Let's talk about real quick, um, and this is also very dated, but we need to talk about it, is your upcoming town hall meeting. Uh, budget, everything else that's going on in the county, and you're venturing going out there again and facing <laughs> the county residents. Uh, the first one's going to be now May 3rd, 7 p.m. at the Chevy Chase um, Friendship Heights um, Center. Uh, what are you expecting? What? Why do you want this connection with the public at this time of the year? Well, we have a, a number of town hall meetings that we schedule throughout the entire year, and we try to get to as many communities as possible. There's been some time uh, since we've last visited the Friendship Heights area and so it's an opportunity for citizens who have concerns about that particular geographical area or about any community throughout Montgomery County. I, I try to make myself as accessible as possible to engage with citizens so that they understand what we are doing and for me to get feedback on a variety of issues. We had some other meetings before but they were basically related to the budget. This is for everything. Well, thank you so very much, Mr. Leggett, for sitting down with us again to talk about what's going on in Montgomery County. Time, we run out, I'm sorry, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, uh, thank you again, and we'll see you next month. Thank and for you. you, thank you for watching. Remember, every information that you need, you find it on the county's website, montgomerycountymd.gov.